welcome to Filibustering History, a podcast series where we discuss what historians do with their lives. I'm Rob Denning, lead faculty for the history programs at Southern New Hampshire University's College of Online and Continuing Education. Joining me today from the far reaches of the West Coast is James Fennessy, the Associate Dean of Faculty for History at SNU, and from the far reaches of the East Coast is Tim Garrity, the Executive Director of the Mount Desert Island Historical Society in Maine. Today we're going to talk about Tim's career, and we're also going to go inside the Mount Desert Island Historical Society. We're going to discuss the relationships between such historical societies and the communities around them, and the opportunities that such organizations provide to history students and to the broader history-loving public. What is your name, and what do you do? My name is Tim Garrity, and I'm the Executive Director of the Mount Desert Island Historical Society in Maine. So as a executive director of a historical society, I am part historian, part nonprofit administrator. I, uh, and one doesn't happen without the other. Uh, as a nonprofit administrator, I am responsible for assuring that there's sufficient funding for our operations and, um, and staff. I get involved in fundraising quite a bit and program planning our like many historical societies, ours is multifaceted with interest in discovering the history of our community, engaging young people, and in our case, from third graders to postgraduate fellows, putting on programs to involve the people who come to visit our area and people who live here. And we also have two museum sites. So we present exhibits in which we try to interpret the the history of our community, which in our case in Mount Desert Island, Maine, is, is a pretty storied history with lots of good documentation of historians that have visited here before and lots of people who have kept records, sometimes eminent people that have been very diligent about keeping photographs and records and materials that are useful to us, us now. And also, we work hard at coordinating what we do with other collecting organizations in our region, the the libraries, historical societies, and other institutions. We have a project underway we call the History Trust, in which we are trying to create a common electronic catalog to encompass all of the collections that pertain to this region and to devise ways to get these materials into safe places so they'll be available a century from now. In other words, into environments where they're protected from fire and destructive elements like light and moisture and and also to thoroughly catalog this material so that it will be more useful to, to researchers. So I guess in summary, we, We have a historical society with a a lot going on, so there's a lot of different facets to our work. You do have a lot going on there, and I want to get back to that and talk a little bit about a day in the life of your historical society and all that. But before we do that, let's, let's, let's talk about you a little bit. What is your academic and professional background? Well, I came upon my present career by a very roundabout route. But if I were to publish a memoir, it would be titled uh, Diary of a Slow Learner. I am <laughs> 61, I'm 61 years old, and I, I began as a college student with little sense of direction. And I, I think a lot of students these days are hearing that you need to have a career, you need to get into a job that pays the rent. And, and I was sort of of the same mind. Uh, I was a liberal arts major in college for two years, but really felt directionless. I ended up joining the Navy and becoming a hospital corpsman because I wanted to have a skill I could call my own and something that I could do. And I kind of am one of those people also who sort of stumbled into a career one step at a time. After I completed my college education while I was in the Navy, they would fly professors out to ships and hospitals in the U.S. where I went to school on weekends and so forth. But I I ended up getting a degree in health services administration from Southern Illinois University. And that's where I got my Bachelor of Science from the School of Technical Careers. And then I went on to get a master's in health services administration from George Washington University while I was in the Washington area. I then went off on a 25-year career as a healthcare executive working as the neurosciences administrator at Johns Hopkins Hospital and at other healthcare systems in 
Pennsylvania and eventually was the chief executive officer of a small hospital in Blue Hill, Maine, uh, Blue Hill Memorial Hospital. And I reached a point in my career after being there for six years where I felt unfulfilled in what I was doing. And, and also, uh, I found that line of work to be extravagantly stressful and just not what I wanted to do. I, and all throughout my career, I kind of had this hunger for really the liberal arts. I used to drool over programs and masters in the MLA, Master in Liberal, of Liberal Arts, that and pursued in my personal reading a, an interest in uh, literature and history. And it just, there was part of me that just was, wasn't getting fed by what I was doing day to day. So I have a very understanding wife and we sort of reached a crossroads where it was the time for me to make a switch in my career. And this was about 10 years ago. And I enrolled in the graduate program in history at the University of Maine and worked my way through that process. I went from a setting where I where I was, you know, the CEO of a small hospital. And then I became a student and I worked for a time at the uh, U.S. Census riding a mountain bike from town to town and uh, on our island uh, working for the census, is working my way through school. I worked as a teaching assistant at the University of Maine. And then I got a job as a park ranger in Acadia National Park and led tours and focused on the history of the area. That combination all came together at a time when there was an opening for the executive director for the Mount Desert Island Historical Society, and I applied and was given the position here. And at the time, I was the sole employee of the organization, and I went from an environment where I was supervising about 400 people to one where I was the sole employee of the organization. And the first thing I had to learn was how to stick an envelope in the printer so that the address would come out on the correct side and right side it up. <laughs> you know, I, I previously had people to do that, and I had to discover that myself. And we are in a setting where we are we raise funds, and I, my previous experience had helped me understand how to work with a governing board, how to uh, how to raise money in the nonprofit environment. And my training at the University of Maine really helped me gain a better understanding of what historians really do. And I've been in this role for the last seven and a half years and love it. I finally have a job that I feel like this is what I was meant to do. And it's, it's something I, I really enjoy. We've, we've enjoyed some success from an organizational standpoint. We now have uh, five year-round employees, uh, several of them from College of the Atlantic, a nearby liberal arts school here, and uh, the University of Maine. We have a good thing going on. So as an executive director, it sounds like that's quite a leap to go from graduating from a grad degree to the Census Bureau and then to executive director of a historical society. Does that sound like a common jump from other <laughs> executive directors, or is this something where you already had possessed a lot of skills like in administration from your hospital days that appealed to the people hiring you for this executive director position? Or basically, is it a combination of your old previous career experience plus grad school, or is it something else that could help you get that job? Well, the, the three core elements from my career experience were my background as a, a nonprofit executive. You know, not necessarily hospital, but knowing how to work in a nonprofit environment where you have to raise money, you have to work with the governing board, you have to have organizational skills, the ability to create a vision and a sense of mission for the organization, know how to handle all the different demands that the organization faces and focus and prioritize the direction of the organization. That That's all encompassed in my nonprofit administration experience. The other was my role as a uh, park ranger in Acadia National Park. Acadia National Park is located on Mount Desert Island. And having worked directly with the uh, history of this place was beneficial. And I think it also eased the board's mind that I was able to work independently. I, I didn't need to be surrounded by a bunch of assistants and work in a suit. You know, they had to get over the formally elevated position I was in that I could really work too. I could take out the trash and, you know, deal with, trim the hedges and deal, deal with stuff that's pretty basic. And then my education as a, uh, having a master's degree in history or at that time uh, with affiliation with the University of Maine and the ability to uh, show them some of my historical work or, or work in the arena of public history. I think that combination kind of led them to uh, give me a chance. And uh, then uh, they've kept me around because we've been able to 
demonstrate growth and connection with the community. And we've got some pretty good projects underway now. I'd like to take a step back really quickly because we asked you to come on and this this executive director position is really fascinating and you're doing some great things, but I want to know how you transitioned into a park ranger position and how your history degree, if it did at all, came into play there because um, I've always loved the outdoors and that idea of being, it's probably a romantic idea <laughs> of being out in, the, uh, out in the environment and wandering around giving tours and doing all of this fun stuff, but not really thinking about the impact of weather, especially up there in Maine. So I'm just wondering how and if, you know, your history degree prepared you for that and some of your experiences as a park ranger. It's totally a romantic job. It's the it's the world's best job. The pay is awful and it's seasonal work, so you don't get to get work year round, but it is a terrific <laughs> job if you can do it. Yes, it very much did. I had a lot of things that one fed the other where I I was sort of the history ranger and the complement of interpretive rangers on this on the staff and led tours. <laughs> history of, ranger needs to be on your business card. <laughs> yeah. That should be on your yeah. <laughs> right. Right. So I would lead hiking tours of a nearby mountain and talk about the road that led up to the parking area, how that was the oldest road and what kind of people lived on it and walked into the cemetery to kind of talk about the different people and some of their backgrounds and somewhere along the way you encounter a road that was created by the Civilian Conservation Corps and you can also talk about our conception of wilderness and how that transitioned from a place of darkness and fear to one where we think of it and as a place of respite and relaxation. So there's many, many historical themes that you can draw, not the least of which is this fabulous geological story to be told of volcanoes and glaciers. So there really, is, this is a rich environment to take a historical perspective. And most rangers come with natural history backgrounds. You know, they'll, they're will they prepared to talk about birds and bees and flowers and plants and trees, and they, they have a very wide range. And everybody's got areas of expertise, but this is one that wasn't common in the in the complement of staff that were present at the time, the summer that I worked there. The big picture for you getting this position as an executive director with the Historical Society is that you're bringing in a lot of different experiences. You're not just bringing in the academic experience. You're also bringing in kind of your experience literally on the ground as a park ranger, but then also your previous experience as an administrator in, in a previous life. That's right. And I see, uh, I, I think uh, I see career transition people, you know, uh, that are circulating in the same group of people you were reaching with your American Historical Association post uh, and, and people that were my uh, colleagues in the grad program that are teachers and that are getting an MA in history or they're ex-military or they're career transition people or even young, young people. Uh, there's lots of ways your experience can, even if it's unrelated, you know, like in healthcare, something can can come to bear on the role we have uh, here in a historical society. Yeah, I think that's important because we tend to break academia apart from what a lot of academics actually call the real world. So the idea that you can blend from the two of them to create a viable career, you don't have to rely on one or the other, you can blend the two together. Well, I think one thing many of your listeners may not understand is how apart these worlds are of the historical society and the academic world and how valuable they can be to each other. And we've tapped that vein in our relationship with College of the Atlantic and University of Maine, where what we have to offer is a fresh field of research, a place that's often untapped by academic historians and what they have to offer us, what, what students have to offer us is their youth and vitality and their curiosity and their the guidance they get from their faculty to, to help them so that we can have a very beneficial relationship. You hear the town gown split and often academic centers are trying to find ways to be influential and meaningful in their communities. And in a historical society setting, they often have not had much exposure to this academic world. I, I've talked to probably thousands of people in different audiences. And in the course of one of my lectures, there's a place for me to ask, have you encountered the word historiography? And unless I'm talking to a college class, I've never encountered any well-educated person who 
wants to hear a lecture on history of this area that's encountered the term historiography. It just shows me how much of a split there is and that by bringing these two communities together, they can both benefit. Definitely. It's a, um, a term and a concept that even some of our strongest students struggle with in our own program, especially at the graduate level. That idea that you're coming in and you're studying history, but you're beginning your studies by studying the history of the history of whatever topic that you're studying. It's kind of a confusing idea to some people. Yes, and when you have a, uh, when you're on an environment like we are in a national park, where this is a very mountainous island, site of Acadia National Park, and in, when the park was founded a century ago, the mountains were all renamed, and they were given names to signify the Indian occupation for 10,000 years, and the colonial settlement, and the French colonial ventures uh, around the founding of New France, and the mountain names were each intended very purposefully for future visitors to read like chapters in a history book. But you know that our conception and the way we talk about history has changed over time, as historiography tells us, and that we would not give them the same names now. You know, we would not name them for Francis Parkman, for instance, because his ideas that were that enthralled the park founders and were very popular at the time now read like they belong in the 19th century. His views on gender and immigrants and race are you know, now uh, appalling to us. So it's very useful to be a public historian in an environment like this, because you can, even in a history that's oft told and embedded in ranger lore that's been passed down for decades or even a century, you still have something new to offer. One of the things we do that we love is our annual magazine that we attempt to be a cross between an academic journal and an accessible work of local history. And we've been carrying it on. We're working on volume 19 now. Uh, so and it's an annual. So for 19 years. And it is uh, really a fun thing that we do. It's a, the current issue is about 160 pages and uh, will compo be comprised of uh, 17 contributions that we pick a theme each year and we really explore it in depth. And we've sometimes had historians write, uh, one, we won even a Pulitzer Prize winning historian, David Hackett Fisher and others uh, are well versed in their field. And we've also had amateur writers and students that have contributed very meaningful things. And we've farmed out the editorial assignments to uh, graduate students at the university, and they've been very engaged and involved. So it's this product that's sort of a cross between the popular and academic genre that's very, very popular in the in the community. We it's a we publish a run of 750 of them and they're they're on shelves all over the all over the island and where visitors uh, come from too well this whole idea about the connection or if you want to talk about the division between popular and academic history is one that's extremely timely right now i mean not only with the controversy over removing various monuments and and how monuments are used and what they mean and how that impacts our understanding of history or if it's an attempt to change history but also connecting to what you're talking about, the naming of places. Recently, the changing of the name of Mount McKinley to um, Denali. And then there was some talk with the current administration of trying to change it back. So this idea of naming places and how this becomes a political sphere, but also it, it's connected to history and what that means and whose history um, and who has, who has control of that. Yeah, and we're able to be an independent voice on National Park Service matters. You know, if uh, the, the Denali becoming McKinley back to Denali and maybe McKinley again is uh, a topic that touches on dozens of residents of this community who happen to be employees of the National Park Service. So by being an independent historical society, we can weigh in without fear of offending somebody who's maybe our ultimate superior <laughs> or the Secretary of the Interior or above. <laughs> and uh, I like the ability to to comment on as a public historian, and sometimes I've taken up topics in letters to the editor in the local newspaper, sometimes in my own voice, sometimes speaking on behalf of the community. But yeah, I think that we become public historians in 
sort of fair arbiters, if that's possible, of uh, the history of the community. We, we try to weigh legends and their validity, and we, we constantly try to shed new light on things. You know, you, you can pass an antique store on the road that has a sign out front that says old stuff. And what we try to do is constantly present new stuff or, or new views on stuff. So it sounds like you really have to kind of walk a fine line between the popular memory of the history of the area versus a more, I don't want to say unbiased, but more objective or more academic history of the area too, especially if you've got like long-term residents who have grew up understanding certain things about the area, which turn out to not be uh, the case. And I imagine that's probably, and and I'm sure that's not an issue just for your particular historical society. I imagine that's something that historical societies probably have to deal with across the country. Yeah, and and the thing is that there's room for many voices. We try to highlight oral histories and common legends that are handed down, and we also try to have new voices. So maybe one way we walk that line is to not walk that line by allowing a forum where lots of people can say things. We we seldom have to are in a position where we are the arbiter of the final word. We try to recognize that over time our take on history will be viewed as archaic. One way we manage the different views on history is give lots of people an opportunity to express what they see, and we provide a positive environment where we try to learn something from these uh, these perspectives. Sometimes we do you know, very directly contradict long-held stories in the community. There's a uh, place here called saint Sever that's supposedly the site of the first French mission in the present day U.S. founded in 1613. And there's a parts of the park that are named for it. And some of the earliest underpinnings of the park were intended to uh, emphasize its historical roots. And this mission was said to be located at a place uh, called Fernald Point. It may well be that that wasn't its site at all. And we've actually disproved several supposed relics of this mission. A a map that was drawn in 1866 turns out to be a hoax, and there was a uh, device or an object, a a weapon-like device dug up from the ground in the 1920s and said to be a relic of the mission, but it turns out it is, uh, we discovered that it's actually a piece of World War I era trench art a letter opener carved from a French 75 millimeter artillery shell. So these are, it, it, it had been hanging in a local library for 70 years and understood to be a relic of the mission. So these are the kind of things we do for fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's, well, that's, that's actually, that's awesome. Yeah, that's actually fascinating because at least then you can, you can point to new evidence and this new evidence is what, what changes the understanding of history, even if it goes against what was popularly held. Whereas one of the points that's really difficult to get across to not only students, but but the general public, and again, this connects to a lot of the debates that we're currently having about culture and politics and history and society, is that our understanding of history also changes throughout time. And a lot of students and people just in general think that history is just a list of the facts that that have happened and they don't understand that history involves interpretation because if we want to look back at all the the facts that have happened i mean we have to decide what's relevant is it relevant that truman you know if truman had woken up the morning that he was going to to make a major decision in his presidency um and didn't brush his teeth and that impacted his day and future policy well then maybe that would be a relevant fact but if that just happened it's a fact but is that really important to history so this understanding of what's relevant what's important that history isn't just a collection of facts but it's how we use those facts in order to interpret what actually happened in the past maybe a way to that we uh, have presented what version of what you just said is that history is a conversation with the past and what we try to do is provide a forum where this conversation can happen and we participate in the conversation we invite other voices into the conversation and we maintain materials and resources so that people can discover more we have a very active website for instance with lots of these original source materials we have a, a significant collection and we try to provide avenue for people to 
discover these things on their own. So I think this is a good discussion of the philosophy that you're pursuing as part of this historical society. Let's talk a little bit about the job itself. So what does a day in your work life look like? I will typically come to the office around nine. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll typically answer email. I'm an early riser. I'm a lark. I get up early and I'll deal with email and stuff like that very early or at a ridiculous hour in the morning with just my quiet time. But I'll come to the office around nine and I will take up the project of the the day, which today was finishing up our annual membership renewal letter. We have to design a letter that will go out to members that it's time to re-up their annual membership payment and compose language that's hopefully persuasive and get ready for this big mailer that we will print and seal the envelopes and send out ourselves and get ready to sign 600 letters, hopefully as many as possible with a thoughtful note in the margin, encouraging people I know to renew, thanking them for their past membership. So that's one project. Another is today's work, Ben, is to uh, plan for a history trust meeting in which we're inviting over 100 members of the boards of the participating 15 organizations to come to a presentation we're calling the digital rollout. We've taken samples of 2,000 objects or documents and had them digitized at the Osher Map Library at the University of Southern Maine. And they're going to be put into a digital platform as a model to demonstrate how much richer we could present the history of the community if people could access all of our collections, not just any one of us. So we're planning for uh, we're planning for that meeting. And then uh, this afternoon, my plan is to line up our authors for our annual magazine and uh, hound the authors that are overdue and get their uh, our, their anonymous readers lined up to review that material, uh, re- review their submissions, and hopefully get this all in a package, all 17 articles in a package. At the same time, the theme for this year is to write about objects in the collections of the various historical organizations that are contributing to the History Trust. And we have, we've commissioned a art photographer to take still life images of each of these uh, objects that the writers are discussing so that each article will be accompanied by an art quality photograph and a short story to tell its tell its history. So we hope to produce something that people will want to have, especially people with an affection for this for this place. And I think that's likely to take up the uh, the rest of my day. The end of the day is a executive committee meeting with our board top thing on the agenda is a board assessment in which we took a survey from the American Association of State and Local History to help individual board members reflect on their personal effectiveness as a member of the governing board. You know, do you attend meetings? Is this among the top three organizations that you contribute to each year? Do you feel fulfilled and satisfied in your work? So we're going to be reviewing the results of that survey to see how well we're doing in uh, providing support and guidance for our board and engaging them in the work that uh, we have. And uh, of course, throughout this, I'll be working with our staff. We have a outreach coordinator who is working on editing an oral history film and uh, designing uh, that mailer that I talked about. And we have our uh, administrative coordinator and when she comes in, we'll be working on uh, the materials for review at the executive committee. So I'll be working with uh, with staff as, as well. Just to get a little view behind the scenes. This is a board of trustees or is this a board of directors? How do, how do you work with them and who are they? Well, we call it a board of directors. I think those terms are interchangeable, but I have a very close relationship with the board chair, Bill Horner. A great, great guy, retired general surgeon, interested in history for a lifetime. The kind of guy who was born in Bar Harbor, the largest town on Mount Desert Island, went to Dartmouth, Enkin, 
work easily in the world of the townie and the gowny. He, you know, he can be a, a, a Bar Harbor kid, who's now 70 something, but also work with summer visitors who tend to be our, our largest contributors. So Bill and I have a very close working relationship in which uh, his role is to keep the board focused on the long-term vision and mission of the historical society and assuring its survival over the long term, which often involves uh, raising sufficient funds to uh, carry out that work. So uh, that's the, my primary relationship with the board, but also our board members are not just people who show up once a month for a meeting, but also are actively engaged as volunteers in our various committees. So I'll sit in on committee meetings that might be development, i.e. fundraising or program in which we plan what kind of programs do we have for the year and we evaluate whether they were effective or not or what we could do, what we could do better or exhibits. So we have our board members engaged in, in that level as well as uh, you know, sometimes in a way they're reporting to staff and sometimes in a way uh, staff is reporting to them depending on what hat they're wearing. And the board members, is this a volunteer position? Yeah, they're all, they're all volunteers. We have this amazing board. Uh, we have people who are, have expertise in finance, in information systems. We have a park ranger. We have uh, people who have varied professional backgrounds, but a real interest in uh, rolling up their sleeves and helping us put programs together. You know, these might be a, a, a history cruise on Frenchman Bay off the shore of Bar Harbor, or they might be involved in the annual strawberry festival and, you know, cutting strawberries and driving a, a farm in central Maine to get two truckloads of strawberries. So it's a very, very much a, a working board in which they, you know, take their, often their professional backgrounds. These people typically, you know, have really accomplished something. They, they lean towards the retired, but we're always trying to uh, maintain a, a mix of working people too. One of our board members is an employee of a history technology company. It's really a, a range of, of skills that in which we try to get uh, our board to contribute in their own way so that working all together, we've got a pretty formidable mix of skills and experience. And so this is also a good way for people to get experience in professional history, even if they're not in a position like an executive director like you. This is still a good way for, say, a history student who's recently graduated maybe can get onto the board of directors, trustees, whatever it happens to be called in a particular society. But it's, it's, it's a way for them to kind of get their foot in the door, gain some experience, which might pay off for them later on. Absolutely. I, I think that your students would find that their skills and experience are highly desired on local historical society boards. I think uh, the, the podcast I, I listened to, you had an example of that. But the first podcast, uh, Chris, was uh, on the list. Yes, I think that your students will be welcomed for their perspective and the experience and training they're gaining in their academic programs and whatever they whatever they bring. I think most historical societies are very eager for people to join their boards. And if your students are tend to be younger, they'd be especially welcomed because uh, historical societies often tend to be pretty gray. You know, uh, <laughs> they tend to be older in their, in their makeup. And uh, I think they'll fall all over themselves to have a young person come in and uh, breathe some fresh ideas and new life into the organization. Earlier, you were talking about opportunities for graduate students that were looking to pursue research opportunities and all of that. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what is the what types of research projects do you collaborate with college students, and how do they go about getting involved in those types of collaborations with you? Well, we post a call for visiting history scholars and a call for our graduate fellowship. We have our visiting history scholars are given a, a small stipend of $1,000 to spend a few weeks working on a project that is of mutual benefit. 
Uh, it may be that uh, we've had students write an article for our magazine, one studied the history of elm trees on Mount Desert Island. It turned out to be fascinating look at the stories these trees could tell if they could talk and how they survived the blight and a little bit of their natural history. We've had two students collaborate on creating a digital map of a devastating fire that occurred here in 1947 that burned about a third of the island's acreage. One was a history student, one was a new media student, and together they compiled a digital exhibit that let you fly over the course of the fire and to see what sort of landmarks were burned and the personal stories and newsreels. We've had another student renovate our website so that it's more useful for researchers and really bring it up into a, a new era. We've had students help us identify and populate a map of properties on the island that are on the National Register of Historic Places. Others have helped us design exhibits. So there's really a the sky's the limit. We've had people help us with transcriptions of manuscripts. Uh, MA English students ended up writing a article for us, a paper for her on um, some of these manuscripts. So there's a wide range for short projects. And we've recently, recently started a fellowship at the graduate level. We call them the Elliott Fellows for the descendants of Charles Elliott, landscape architect. And as a young man, he headed a group of students who came here and their study of natural history help people understand the value of this place that led ultimately to the creation of Acadia National Park. And so this, these Elliott Fellows are students that are farther advanced in their careers. And our first one, Eric Reardon, a recent PhD grad from the University of Maine, undertook a number of things for us in collaboration with the National Park. He created a history of freshwater fishing on the island that turned into a seven-minute documentary that we've posted on our web and he's also serving as the co-editor of our magazine so he is receiving articles from authors and editing them and helping us design this uh, edition into a coherent presentation of to follow its theme of focusing on the island's collections and the stories that it can tell that's a great collection of projects and so do you normally post these calls for researchers and all that on your society website or do you post in national journals or national websites where would students go to look maybe not specifically for your organization but in general do you think they should usually look at their own local historical society's website or should they go to national job search sites how does, how does that usually work for you well in our case we will uh appeal directly to the faculty at College of the Atlantic and University of Maine. And we will put it on our social media outlets, primarily Facebook. And I would think that your students, uh, wherever they are, if they're working with local historical societies, those opportunities will show up on their Facebook page. And maybe in national national settings, but I think most local his, most historical societies tend to be local or widest regional in their focus. So I I would go to where they're communicating. You know, they tend to be communicating with their communities. And I think too that they could take the initiative on some of these things. The, some of these things might not be ideas that are really percolating in uh, some local historical societies, but they might be able to reach in and propose a project and would be welcomed. We're in a rather unusual situation. We, ha we have three full-time year-round staff and uh, many historical societies operate on a much more modest schedule because they just don't have the resources for that. So I think to really get a rise out of your local historical society, you might go, you, you might need to sit down with people and have a conversation. I know that there are some organizations like the Island Institute that will put interns out on islands where, in the case of Swans Island on the coast of Maine, interns have helped to reconstruct a collection lost in a fire, you know, to help gather material and to conduct oral histories and create web pages. So there may be third party funders of internship opportunities too, or, you know, perhaps within the university setting. I know at the University of Maine, there's a center for the humanities that has modest stipends available for students. 
And if they were to collaborate with a local historical society, they, they might be able to put together a proposal to create some funding around it. Is there anything else that you'd like to mention about your career or your institution or anything that we haven't covered yet? Well, one question that I, I, I thought about ahead of time is what sort of areas are, are you studying and uh, what sort of resources would you recommend? And uh, just a, a short answer to that is that I did my master's thesis on the effect of the Civil War on Mount Desert Island. And I found many wonderful collections of letters that I in turn could tie to regimental histories and the collections in the National Archives and Library of Congress. And it was a fascinating study that enabled me to put together the secondary Civil War literature and the intimacy that comes from having town records and personal correspondence of individual soldiers. So that's, uh, that's one thing to mention. And then just something very general that I've enjoyed accessing might be of interest to New England students in particular, and that is the collection called the Jesuit Relations. These are some of the earliest documents of the French Jesuit missionaries that came here in the 17th and 18th century and reported on their encounters with New France or in New France their encounters with the Indians and uh, some of the uh, incredible hardships they endured in attempting to find this, uh, to create this new world for France. And that's been relevant to our studies here because uh, the French settlement of Acadia at its southern edge encompassed this uh, this region. And it's a wonderful, uh, the French relations are a wonderful resource that are available electronically. James, do you have a recommendation for us this week? Sure. Um, mine is, given the conversation that we just had way off topic, <laughs> but um, it's a bit more timely with current events. It's actually on my bookshelf. I haven't read it yet, but um, there is a publication out called Gilded Suffragists, the New York socialites who fought for uh, women's right to vote. It's by, uh, who is it, Johanna Newman, I believe that's how you pronounce her name. And um, yes. it's about the female socialites who were very influential and instrumental in gaining the right for women to vote back in the early 20th century. So we're talking about the Astors, the Rockefellers, the Vanderbilts. So given the recent 100-year commemoration of the right to vote for women in New York, it's a timely read. And I haven't read it yet, but it's on the bookshelf. Hey, that's interesting. And, and many of those, the Astors and Rockefellers had quite a history here on Mount Desert Island, too. I can imagine that must have been quite a vacation spot for a lot of the yeah, super rich. Yeah. So not so far off topic, James. <laughs> well, it, and throughout the Northeast as well. I mean, all of the, the rich from the, you know, the late 19th, early 20th century saw the Northeast as their playground. I grew up in upstate New York. So throughout the Adirondacks, I mean, you see the the remnants of their activity in that area as well. That's great. So my recommendation is for a blog called The Junto. It's a group blog on early American history, and they have a series from earlier this year. They talk about where historians work. And so in, in many ways, it's kind of similar to the project that we're doing here, but this one is just a blog. They're a collection of brief interviews with people that it sounds like they have positions a lot like a lot like you, Tim. So we've got those executive directors for Congregational Library and Archives. They've got head of public services librarian at Western New Mexico University, executive directors of research centers, talking about career opportunities that sound a lot kind of like what, what Tim does. And so I will uh, put the link to that blog in the notes for, for this episode also. But it's an interesting introduction to a variety of careers that are open to students of history outside of the traditional academic track, kind of like what we've been talking about in this podcast series. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, well, thank you, Tim, for joining us today. Rob and James, thanks very much for the opportunity and for all the work you're putting into this podcast. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. It's been great talking to you. And thank you to everybody out there in the podcast sphere for listening to us today. If you have any questions or comments on this podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please send us an email at snhuhistory at gmail.com. For James Fennessy and Tim Garrity, I'm Rob Denning. Thanks for listening and have a good day.